Um, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for coming along to this afternoon's debate. Uh, my name is Claire Baker, MSP. I'm a member of the Scottish Parliament for Mid Scotland and Fife, and I am convener of the Economy and Fair Work Committee. Uh, this is the 20th year that we've had the Festival of Politics. Uh, it's five days of discussion and activities, and I hope uh, you're able to attend other events as well as the one you're here for um, today. So I look forward to hearing everyone's uh, points and discussions. Just a reminder that we will be respectful to the people's points of views and uh, to listen to everybody and give them their space. So this afternoon, this is Jobs and the Just Transition Back to the 80s. And I'm, we're pleased that we're doing it in partnership with Aberdeen uh, University. Uh, if you'd like to share your thoughts, you can do so on Twitter. Well, it's not Twitter, it's now X, sorry. Uh, uh, visit Scottish, so visit Scott Parrell um, or on Instagram at Scottish Scott Parrell. Uh, the event has also been recorded and it will be available on the YouTube panel uh, for the Scottish Parliament in the next few weeks. So I'll introduce our panellists to you. Uh, I'm joined by Professor Tavis uh, Potts. Tavis is a personal chair in sustainable development and environmental governance at the University of Aberdeen. Uh, Dr Ewan Gibbs is a lecturer in Global Inequalities at the University of Glasgow. He's a historian of energy, industry, work and protest. And Nicky Wilson uh, worked in the coal industry from 1967 to 2002. Uh, and by 1987, Nicky was president of the NUM Scotland. In 1989, he was elected general secretary of the NUM Scotland area and remains in this position. And Nicky is also chair of the Coalfields Regeneration Trust, which might be relevant to the discussion uh, we're going to have this afternoon. Um, if I start with um, a question around just transition, so some of you may know that our committee, the Economy and Fair Work Committee, recently did inquiries into a just transition for Grangemouth and a just transition for the North East. And one of the issues that we looked at was what does just transition mean? Should there be an agreed definition of what it means and how do we know if we achieve it or not? Um, so I'll maybe come to um, Tavis uh, first of all, if you want to maybe say a bit about your thoughts around that. Yeah, so the question we get asked quite a lot, this definitional question, and um, it's really simple for me. It's, it's take people with you along on the journey towards net zero. Um, you know, uh, don't destroy people's livelihoods. Um, and the just bit is really important. It's about justice. So I link or we link social justice very much to the outcomes of the transition and it's social justice is as just as important as decarbonisation uh, in the process towards net zero. We take, um, in the group that, that I work in, um, called the Just Transitions Lab, uh, we've, we've widened the scope. Jobs, uh, employment is at the heart of a just transition, but it's not the only thing. And it can actually get a bit myopic, just solely focused on jobs. Jobs are absolutely critical. We need good green jobs as we transition out of fossil fuel industries and into new green sectors. But we also need to address things such as communities and the perilous state of infrastructure and towns and villages. You know, Aberdeen was one of the richest cities in the UK, yet we're shutting libraries and pools and public facilities left, right and center. So it's about communities, it's about revitalizing local infrastructure and it's critically about health and well-being as well in those communities that are facing transition. So we say it's four things, jobs, health, communities and infrastructure make up a just transition. Thank you. Um, Ewan, do you want to...? Yeah, I, I think in a, in a very straightforward way, it means a fair and equitable movement from a society and an economy that's based on fossil fuel production and use towards one that's based on sustainable production and use of, of renewable energies. And I think it's important that, that that's about both the form that that movement that takes, so there's a procedural element of justice as well as the outcome, that this is seen as a, a democratic process that's particularly shaped by workforces and communities that are currently depending on carbon-based production and that are going to be there for front and centre of these changes. And obviously that's why we're here today to discuss the 1980s and the coal fields and the, the current situation facing the oil and gas workforce in Scotland. And Nikki, if I come to you around a just transition, if you want to say how you would define a just transition, but maybe, as Ewan has said, reflecting on what happened the last time we went through a big industrial change and how that impacted on our, on our communities. Yeah, well, unfortunately, just transition didn't exist as far as we were concerned in the 1980s. 
It's a phrase that's been introduced since, and I, I wish it had been. Because even if we look back a bit further than the 80s, into the 60s, 50s, 60s, 70s, when there was a lot of pit closures, but there was a transition into other forms of employment, you had car works being built, you'd, where I worked in, in Cardown Colliery in the Glasgow area, you had the black and white whiskey bond built, you had the Devra sausage factory, all these things were there out with the actual industry. But when we came to the 80s, there was nothing, and it was that's why industrial dispute went on so long because we weren't, you know, we knew what was coming. Because as the pit closures had went from, you know, the 60s into the 70s, there was a lot of transfer of jobs to bigger coal mines because of mechanisation, introducing modern machinery, which the small pits couldn't operate anyway. And that all happened, but then when we started getting into the late 70s, into the 80s, there was a realisation that there was no, no such thing as just transition because the jobs were going and it was the life in the dole or if you were lucky you would get a job. And the other sad fact of life was that, although as a trade unionist I would argue we were never well enough paid, but there were quite well paid jobs in the coal mining industry. And when they went... And because of the community side, as we talk about, many of the communities were there because there was a coal mine there, then that had a tragic effect in the demise of the industry. Mm -hmm. And it is one of the, I suppose, the defining, um, for me, it's one of the defining political instances of, of my lifetime, was growing up during the 80s. And I grew up in Kelty, which was a mining village. It's no longer a mining village. And Fife's an area that was heavily impacted by the closure of the mines. Mm -hmm. And it was communities you felt were abandoned by a government when industrial change happened. And that'll be similar to a lot of politicians in here, I think, have that kind of background. So when we're talking about a just transition, and everybody's committed to that not happening again, and Tavis, you've talked about the work being done at Aberdeen, because you know, everybody's talked in kind of broad terms about what a just transition means, and I think everybody understands that. But for politicians, how do you know if government's delivering on it? What is the... Do we, should we have a set of indicators? Now, there might not be a perfect set of indicators, but it would let us know how do we measure whether it's happened or not. So 10 years down the line, can we look back and say, oh, that was a just transition, or how do we go to, to know that we did achieve it? Yeah, we've just produced a report on that. That wasn't a segue or a plant. We've actually just we've actually done some work um, measuring a just transition. We've got 55 or so different indicators under those four buckets that I talked about. So we, we look at, for example, and this is not just about Aberdeen. This is about the world, the UK and Scotland in it. But we, we're working in Aberdeen. We're discussing Aberdeen just now. It's, for example, looking at the state of the Aberdeen High Street. It has the highest rate of shop closures outside of and, and lowest recovery outside of, you know, in, in Scotland. You know, Dundee and Glasgow and Edinburgh are, are much more recovery on the high streets. We look at the rise of feud banks and fuel poverty has grown in Aberdeen. We look at um, the State of Cities report 2024, which out of 62 UK cities and large towns in terms of job creation, new job creation, Aberdeen is number 62nd. It has 10% loss of new job creation. It's the bottom of the pile over the decades. So these aren't things that started last week. These are things that have been going structurally for over a decade. And we've got to start talking about the solutions about those. But we've got some indicators which are uh, one way of informing progress. Indicators are great. They help us make judgments. They inform policy. But the next question is, what do we do about them when they're starting to turn the wrong direction? What's the policy response? What's the social response? What's the business response? Yeah. We're not quite there yet. Yeah, because yeah, as I said, the committee did two inquiries, one into the North East and one into Grangemouth, which were two regional areas we identified as facing particular challenges in terms of a, a just transition. How do the panellists think that... Um, because when we talk about the North East, there is a lot of employment, Sometimes it's generational employment into what was secure employment and was fairly well paid employment. How do we, when we're making that transition, bring trade unions and workers along with us and that they recognise the need for it to happen and that we can support them into other um, employments or other opportunities? How do we make sure that happens? Um, well, I could, I could kick, the, kick the ball off. and it, It's having um, democratic process at the heart of the nature of the discussions around transition. Um, in Aberdeen, I don't feel that's actually been the case. 
I think there's been a, a dominance of the energy industry for, for generations. It's done a lot of good things for the city. Aberdeen's a far more cosmopolitan place than what it would have been without the oil and gas industry. There's been a lot of some investment, but most of the money is not stayed in Aberdeen. It's it's gone, you know, it's gone offshore. It hasn't, and that's why we're shutting pools and shutting public facilities and libraries left, right, and centre. But that process of change really has to have communities and workforces at its heart, and we are working constantly to make that a, a, a an equitable conversation where we get good representation around the table, uh, whether it's from city planning, whether it's the new developments that are coming in, uh, whether it's the nature of what net zero means for the city. We haven't had that. And we're doing a lot of work to make sure that communities, uh, workforces, that diverse groups are represented, people who are not at the table of net zero, it can, tends to get dominated by a very limited demographic. And we want to make that open and democratic and a real productive and positive discussion about what the future means. Not just Aberdeen, but across the board. And then, do you have, if I come to you um, to reflect on that, but do you have any, or do you know of any examples of other countries or other regions where you know, they, they are success or they have a successful plan for a just transition? Because at the moment, one of the criticisms the committee had was while Grangemouth, we're still waiting on the Grangemouth Just Transition Plan, there's already been an announcement made to close the oil refinery and we're still at the stage of trying to work out what the plan is. I actually think we could start by looking to our own history and the transition out of coal and not think about the 1980s, but think about the period that Nicky mentioned in the 1950s, 1960s and 1970s. I'm not suggesting that mining workforces were always happy at the closure of collieries in the 1960s or 1970s, but Scotland had a workforce of around 85,000 miners in the late 1950s. Its workforce was considerably less than half of that total by the early 1970s, and the coal fields weren't wrecked by the same levels of devastation or mass unemployment that they were in the 1980s and 1990s, where actually a numerically smaller group of miners were made redundant through colliery closures. Why was that possible? It was possible because we had a relatively just form of transition. Um, we had, I think, questions around control and ownership, along with democracy and transparency, are centrally important here. At that point in time, Britain's largest, most important energy industry, the coal industry, was under public ownership. Um, trade unions had a relatively high degree of negotiation and consultation within that industry, and its future was planned years in advance. Um, collieries were expected to close, and they were part of a relatively orderly transition for miners who remained within the industry. And accompanying that, you had investment in new, new sectors. Um, one of the, the cases I always point towards was the, the building of a very large modern machinery factory by Caterpillar Tractors on um, a ruined mine, a derelict former mining village in Tannock Side in Lanarkshire. This was a hopeful period where the closure of mines meant actually advancement towards cleaner, safer employment and the creation of better jobs for miners' sons and their daughters, importantly, in a more diverse industrial labour market. Now, I know the Grangemouth case relatively well. I recently uh, co-authored a report for the Just Transition Commission who advised the Scottish Government um, my colleague, Rio Koshibe, is in the audience who uh, co-authored that report, so I better be careful how I describe it. But um, I think what we have in Grangemouth is something very, very different to that situation in the coal industry. We don't have, we don't have a public conversation discussion around it where there's actually empowered actors making democratically accountable decisions. You know, I, I read the important report that your committee produced, and any of didn't even appear before your committee to provide evidence. That's some way from the active involvement in the National Coal Board and the, the planning for the future of coalfield regions as they were running down employment in the 1960s. And I think the workers that Ryoko and I spoke to when we were writing our report, they felt quite distant from the official just transition discussion as they saw it, which they felt was quite distant from important consequential decisions that were being made in their workplaces by managers that were often very remote from Grangemouth in Scotland. And Nikki, do you have any comments around this yeah. area and around the role for <coughs> unions and employers in this? Yeah, area? I mean, I know the North East well because I was actually born in Huntley, believe it or not, and uh, I moved 
down as a toddler to Glasgow for my father to get work in the steel industry down here. So, and I, most of my relations, I know the importance of the industry to people in the North East. And it's probably the most similar we can picture in relation to coalfield areas, in a sense, because of the reliability in that particular area. But, I mean, what saddens me is when we talk about just transitions and... The, the last time I believe that this country produced an energy policy, a long-term one, was in 1978, which was the plan for coal done under Callan's government, which was then torn up by the subsequent next government, the Conservative government. And unless we get to having a national plan for long-term energy policy, not one election to the next election and changing it, then I don't think anything will work. And as, as far as I'm concerned, I mean, we've had this argument in the trade union movement for years that, you know, the skill factors, the engineering jobs, the manufacturing jobs in this country have been lost, and deliberately so in many cases. And we were just talking earlier, and, and my biggest grump is the fact that we're probably, well, I think we are the biggest producer of wind power, and certainly in Europe, if not the world, We've now got more potential for it happening in England now that they're, they're agreeing to have onshore wind again. But we don't manufacture any of them. And that is where I think we've lost out. And that's where I would like to see government, whatever government, having that long-term plan that we will manufacture these things, not just put them together when they're floated in barges for thousands of miles away, and have that, you think of the, the, the skills that could come again, the apprenticeships, all the rest of it. And that's where I think we lack and have lacked for years in this country. We need a long-term policy that will succeed success of governments as necessary. And that's, I think, why the state we're in just now has happened, you know. Mm. So just to add to Nikki's point, is that <laughs> um, the Scottish government's energy strategy has been in draft for two years still not out yet at a time of climate crisis and massive change in in the energy industry we still don't have the plan where is it where is it i suppose that maybe brings me to a question because we have had a change of government recently at uk level and there's two questions in there one is about nikki's point about how do you have long term regardless of who's in government there's a plan that's laid out and that everybody agrees with it and actually, at the moment, we're possibly seeing more tensions around agreement with it. As the Conservatives move into opposition, there seems to be more chat around them about, not climate denial, but about questioning the rate of the pace at which we need to make changes and kind of putting a break on that. And Farage and his party are now elected and have representatives. They are in favour of issuing new licences of oil and gas and just kind of ignoring the climate crisis. And then you've got Labour government introduced who are going to set up GB Energy, which will be based in Scotland. So I don't know if you have any reflections on, on, on that. What do you think GB Energy might be able to achieve? Is it going to address some of these issues around um, where the state intervenes to make positive changes and has more levers and strength to do that? And how do we try to make that longer term decisions, regardless of who is in government, to, you know, because it it's a longer term plan, how do we secure that? If I'm going to come to you first, have it. That's a lot to reflect on. Sort of um, we'll be here all afternoon. Um, so I had real high hopes for GB Energy. Um, I thought in the concept it was it was a good idea. I still don't know what it what it's going to be, what it, what it looks like. Um, but when I was thinking about it originally, I thought here's a great opportunity for uh, a publicly owned um, energy provider that not only just um, invests in uh, risky renewables or supports community energy, which is fantastic, but actually is able to sell energy and own or co-own or build partnerships with the public um, to deliver that energy at scale. And I think community scale and decentralised renewable energy is one of the biggest opportunities that we have in Scotland and in the UK. 
and it's, it's still very small, it's growing rapidly, but in terms of the jobs it can provide, in, in terms of keeping people in places to rebuild our infrastructure, to work directly with communities, I think it, it, it offers a major opportunity and I'd like to see GB Energy, and it's said it is going to get behind it, but it, it obviously we'll see what happens. I think one of the biggest mistakes that the, the new Labor government made was actually cutting its green investment in half from the 24 billion you know, down to, 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 to less than 10. I think that was a major mistake and we had um, companies such as the, the CEO of Siemens saying, uh, you invest, every, every pound you invest, you'll get you know, two pounds 50 to four pounds back in investment. This will grow the green economy. This is the greatest economic opportunity of the age to get this right. And UK needs to be at the forefront of it and Scotland needs to be at the forefront of it. But communities need to be at the heart of it and then get the benefits from being a part of that. Just transition is as just as much about the price that people pay for energy in rural areas where there are loads of wind farms and they don't get the cheap bills. They get village halls, they get very uh, contested and, 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 and spread out you know, investments, the village hall effect. They need investment in infrastructure. They need cheaper bills, just as much as the workers in oil and gas in Aberdeen you need to go and be supported into new areas and new industries. Mm -hmm. I mean, Labour has been in government for, I think, six or seven weeks at the moment, and they will have an announcement soon on GB Energy. There has been the difference between, you know, we saw America put big investment in, Europe put in big investment. While I know people are disappointed with the reduction in the figure, you still, would you agree, you still got a government that seems that we're open for business, that we're taking this seriously Absolutely. compared it's to where we were totally before. totally different d dialogue and world and, and one that's more, I think, positive about what Net Zero can offer. But let's not fall back into more of the same. Let's genuinely try to do things differently yeah. with going forward. And a publicly owned um, organisation will be really central to delivering that. You know, hold hold your nerve, <laughs> keep keep it going forward, don't fall into the trap that's made by the populists. Because yeah. net zero is good for the economy, it's good for people, it's good for communities, and it's great for climate. Yeah. Uh, Ewan, do you want to maybe reflect on some of that? And the, um, I suppose, the ten do you think there's an increase in political tension around, you know, there, there's like, there's like the, the consensus around the need to make changes, is that at risk as we move into different political debates? Oppositions. I'm going to start by talking about GB Energy and I'm going to come back to that, um, that more specific question that you asked. I, I think the question of what GB Energy is going to be is going to be crucial to the answer to the, the larger question of the current situation and the, the status of climate action. I, I felt quite inspired and, and hopeful when Ed Miliband announced that the British public should make things and own things again. I thought that was that was hopeful. And I think actually it accords with our common sense that we have about energy. We do think that our wind resources, our solar resources should be rewarding for the public as a whole and especially for the communities where those resources are being harnessed and exploited. But at the moment, we're not seeing suitable rewards for that. You know, I, I think really the, the small community payments that communities that host very large wind farms, which are creating large amounts of profit for multinationals, which include um, energy companies that are owned by foreign governments, by the way. Um, I think that that's not a, a desirable situation, and it certainly creates a gateway for climate scepticism, for, um, you know, op or certainly opposition to, to future climate action. Um, at the moment, I think GB Energy, whatever form it takes, is a step forward to what we've had in the recent past. And it comes with, as Nikki alluded to, the, the important you know, reversing of the ban on onshore wind uh, developments in, in England. But nevertheless, it, it looks like it might well be a vehicle that's largely about so-called de-risking, i.e. incentivising further private investment and ownership of, of, our, of our energy industry. And, I think it's important that we actually think about what we want a renewable energy sector to offer. So we've, we've sort of sat around this table and I think we've all agreed that one of the things we want it to offer is uh, manufacturing employment. We've said we probably want it to offer cheaper energy for, for consumers. Um, 
One of the problems with uh, wind energy is it's cheap and it's abundant and it's plentiful, but it's not necessarily very profitable. And actually, it's, its operation has relied on significant subsidies, effectively, of various forms, and price setting, which is another form of subsidy, really being offered by government. And on that basis, we've achieved the development of a very large wind sector by international standards, which is an achievement. Um, but it's not necessarily offered these other rewards, and its continued development is going to be on, in that model is going to be reliant on the further production of subsidies and so-called de-risking. And I think it also means that its further development will be reliant on private actors or foreign state-owned enterprises acting first and the UK government responding afterwards, which isn't a very positive situation. And it's interesting that if we think about how, where that model's had failings. So last year, the, the last round of contract for difference, which is the the, the, the auction rounds for um, for future wind developments, the UK government set the price too low and it didn't attract the interest that it expected it to. Um, in the United States, there's been a similar problem with Biden's Inflation Reduction Act, which is hailed as this very important you know, initiative marking a, a clear orientation towards a green energy future and also towards state intervention in the American economy, but it's reliant on a similar model of, of de-risking and subsidy, and it's not moved forward at the pace that was anticipated. So I think we really need to question that model. Although some of that not inevitable, um, and the committee, you know, we've heard the cost of a just transition is, is billions. The amount of money involved and the scale involved is just not possible for a government alone to deliver. And that I suppose the Scottish National Investment Bank in Scotland is there as a kind of de-risk uh, operation. Is that is there countries that are? And you've, you've illustrated America, but it's not really worked in America. I suppose they've done a similar model, but it's just the scale and the amount of investment that's needed. Is it realistic for government to be? They can provide it off that. I mean, I'm not necessarily suggesting this is a straightforward model we can adopt, but if you look at a country that's developing a huge renewable and energy sector, it's China, and it's a country that has large state-owned enterprises active in the manufacturing of renewables and in, in, in offshore and onshore wind and in solar panels. So if we... Because there's been a lot of... Um, recently, a lot of, a lot of excitement around the fact that global offshore wind capacity has increased massively, but it's basically all increased in one place, if you look at where that's distributed. And I do, I do think we need a frank discussion about the models of, of political economy that, that we're looking towards. So, I mean, I would also point out that one of the other countries in Europe that had a very large energy transition in the late 20th century was France. Now, they adopted nuclear power. I'm not suggesting that that's our way forward necessarily, but they were able to do that because they had a similar model of, of integrated public ownership. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, my view is that I think, you know, the concept of GB energy is, is great, but I think, as they've said, that the chain has got to start with manufacturing, go up to installation, putting them together, maintenance, and that's the potential It's there if we get this right, but I'm not convinced that's... I don't think anybody really knows what the model is at this stage. But the other point, which I think that I've, both you and Travis has touched on as well, is when are the public when are the public going to get benefits of all this investment in renewables? Because that seminar was at last year from international uh, coal mining unions, but they touched on that. And I asked the question, I says, well, why is it and, and the UK has got the biggest wind power output in Europe, but the public hasn't benefited because apparently the price is tied to the price of gas. Now, why is that? And the answer I got there, and I don't know if you know any better, was it's a European agreement, but we left Europe, you know. So that's what puzzles me is... And remember, a lot of people paid off their bills. I think at one stage it was 11% of your bill was for investment in your renewables. So all the public have paid as well as are contributed as well as the government, but we've not seen any benefit. And that is the problem. I think, why is it that your renewable costs, and I'm, no, I'm not an expert, Matt, and I can't tell you, but I imagine they'll be much cheaper than 
oil or any of the other ones, why is it we're not getting that benefit? And I think the answer I, I, I suspect is that the companies that do the renewables, as Hugh has said, are making massive profits out of this. Plus the government, if we're going to be cynical about it, is getting tax on those profits anyway. But let's have a bit of honesty and transparency about this. And I think if there's a price that the renewables can produce the electricity at, then that's what the public should be able to buy it at. None of this nonsense about it's got to be tied to the price of gas or anything. Mm. And I think that's where it's all lacking in this country, mm. to be honest. Mm -hmm. And there's some of that, <coughs> Nikki's points, because it's international agreements, it's not as easy for, in, for us as an individual country to make changes to price structuring because it's quite complicated, the energy market, but is that correct? Because it's tied into um, whether it's European agreements, international agreements about how... And it's traded also at international and European level. So just you know, have debates here about oil and gas, about money for oil and gas, but it's sold on an international market. It's not, um, it's not sold or used solely within the UK. It's competing at a different level. Do, I don't know if you and or Tavis want to talk a bit, a bit about price and how could we reduce... Because we're all living with... Um, but, you know, we're expected off Jim to announce to increase the price cap in the next few days. Uh, we've had a few years now, and part of that has been also what's happened in Ukraine and, and other issues that have had an impact on global prices. But how do we address that issue and try and deliver more affordable energy for people? At the same time as tied into that, you're trying to reduce their energy. So you and you talked about, you know, when energy was plentiful and it was cheap and we could use it, would there be a concern that people would just use more of it then and don't actually try and recognise the need to reduce uh, the energy that they're using as well? I think there's been too much attention almost to individual energy use at the consumer level and not enough thoughts about the sorts of public action we need to take in that accord. I mean, we, I think it's been common sense amongst energy analysts in Britain since at least the energy crisis of the 1970s when there was a massive increase in oil price that we need to use a lot less energy, that actually using less energy is is the biggest step we can take towards you know living more sustainably in an environmentally friendly way. And also to living happier, more contented, less impoverished lives. I mean, lots of us live in really badly insulated housing in this country. Uh, we should have a crash programme of uh, skills creation that you know, might also be a means of just transition for some workers that are, that are engaged in carbon intensive work that would use their skills um, to retrofit buildings around the country. That, that's an area that we could definitely see considerable action on that should involve, I think, the UK and Scottish governments, but should involve local authorities, community enterprises. You know, there's a whole way up the chain that, that we could look to that. Um, in terms of the international energy market, there's, there's a couple of comments that I, I wanted to, to think about that in relation to the debate on oil and gas licences that you mentioned before, because I, I think there's been a somewhat spurious discussion around energy security and North Sea oil production. Um, I think it's firstly important to recognise that for a considerable amount of time now, around 20 years, Britain has become a an importer of hydrocarbons again. So we had a period of around a quarter of a century between the early 80s and the mid-2000s when we were exporting more oil and gas than we were importing. But even then, the, the, I think a lot of people don't understand that oil isn't a single product. So there's lot, oil that comes out of the ground in the North Sea is actually quite different to oil that comes out of the ground in the Middle East and it's used for different purposes. Um, Grangemouth Refinery, for instance, imports oil through the Finart Terminal on the west coast of Scotland, which I think, from what I understand from interviews, largely comes from West Africa, and it exports oil from the North Sea that is piped to, to Grangemouth uh, from the 40s pipeline through to the Kinneal Terminal. It processes that oil, but that's exported abroad for different purposes. So. The idea that there's some sort of straightforward story where we can become, you know, self-sufficient in oil again. I mean, there's not, the North Sea industry isn't going to go in that direction anyway. It's been contracting in terms of workforce and production for a long period of time. And the discussion is really over how we phase and manage that, that contraction. But there also isn't some straightforward way to security and pricing autonomy there either. 
just on energy prices, I, I, I'm not, not an expert in that topic, but I, I think we need reform of, of locational pricing. We need to ensure that, that the communities where energy developments are housed are rewarded for that. We need to address the growing social movement, say, around pylons, for example, or siting of solar farms, where there's actually a real stake that communities have. And that's, that is, there is a genuine dialogue between communities and developers up front, not, not way down the road when things have been decided. Uh, and I think there's an opportunity around that to make that work for people. Um, and I think it's totally within our remit within the UK to look at, at pricing and decoupling. Um, uh, and Middleband's talked about this, decoupling electricity prices from gas, because mm -hmm. gas doesn't provide energy security. It provides profit. Uh, we use a lot of gas, but energy security comes from both climate security and investment in communities, mm -hmm. as much as after being able to turn on the, the television at night time. Um, you know, you can tell I've got a really strong Aberdeen accent. <laughs> <laughs> um, being from Sydney, um, mm -hmm. but I've been here for 20 years. Um, and, uh, but just looking at my home country, um, we're not a model either for, for, for energy development, but nearly every single home in Australia now has extensive solar panels um, and, uh, and a Powerwall battery, and they're so cheap and they're so extensive um, that uh, they're now having to shut down the coal-fired power stations, which... My dad worked in for all his life, um, and the, the maintenance of the of the centralised energy system mm. is changing. They can't afford to maintain lines and poles because most houses are generally self sufficient or very high, close to being self sufficient in production of, of hot water or conditioning or energy, and so it's it's the households that benefit mm. from that. Mm. Now, obviously, being in Scotland, sun is not massively plentiful, but it is there, and it would make actually a significant mm. difference. And here's an innovation opportunity. What about things like micro turbines for roof or for wind? You know, been living on the east coast of, of Aberdeen or Nubra, where it's windy 24-7. And where's our innovation here? Where's our mass production manufacturing mm. of this? Mm. Mm -hmm. If I was an oil and gas worker in Aberdeen, I'd be looking at how could I set up as soon as possible to get into retrofitting. The biggest challenge that we have in the northeast is, is, is retrofitting our granite homes. We're in the process of demolishing or plans for demolishing large swaths of, of, of torrey in South Aberdeen because of rack concrete. 500 homes are planned to get. We should be rebuilding those homes and making them greener and actually investing in those communities and employing local people to do it. Mm -hmm. So stitch up these plans, have some integration. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And when you talked about the Australian model, was there, for people, was, that, was there a subsidy to enable people to cha make those changes to their own homes? How was that? Or was it just that there was, there was, comp was, it, the mar was it left to the market? Or was there government intervention and subsidy to encourage that switch? It's, as far as I was aware, there wasn't a subsidy. It just became very cheap. Yeah. Um, and the prices of solar panels dropped immensely. Yeah, yeah. So you could either pay the utility through the nose for electricity, for hot water or air conditioning, um, or you could invest $5,000 mm -hmm. and have your roof covered and get mm -hmm. a power wall and get a deal. And there's been some innovative financial models where, and I still don't see these widespread in the UK, where you could, for example, um, not pay a cent, um, but you pay your energy bill over seven or eight years to the utility who provides the upfront capital because Transition won't happen if households have to pay 20, 30 grand to insulate and put... It just won't happen. No, no one's got that money. So where's the innovation here? Where's the financial innovation? Where's the manufacturing innovation? Again, bringing these systems together that don't talk or communicate and looking at elsewhere where it, has, where it does work. Yeah. That's where the jobs are. That's where the community benefits are. Yeah, so, sorry, you didn't talk to me. It's okay just to add to... to these really helpful comments. Um, I think it's important we also think about geographical equity here. That you know, in terms of the renewable transition, what we're essentially expecting in the central belt and the southeast of England and the south of England more generally is frankly that the rest of the country, rural, often poorer areas, are going to be used to provide electricity for our benefit on a renewable basis. And I think there needs to be a much more serious discussion about what rewards the highlands, the islands, the other parts of, of the country that, that are going to be used for, for this sort of generation are actually going to expect to receive and going to get from this. And I think that that should involve jobs in 
in the industry and in, in the, the manufacturing supply chain that, that Nicky's mentioned, but I think it should involve more widespread benefits for these areas as well. Um, you know, because there's contradictions even associated with, say, the oil and gas developments in that respect, that, you know, Shetland uh, is home to Sullen Bow, which was Europe's largest oil and gas terminal, but it was never on the gas grid and had phenomenally high rates of fuel poverty, um, mm -hmm. especially amongst families that didn't enjoy employment in the oil and gas industry. And so I think those... There's a danger that we repeat these sorts of contradictions all over again, or, or already are doing that in the development of the renewables industries, that actually the places that have the highest heating and electricity costs in the country, that have less benefit from the utilities that um, renewable energy are going to power, are actually those that are right next to where these renewable energies are being harnessed. Mm. And do you think that kind of thing would help with, and we do have tensions around planning and around, you know, we need it for generating energy up in the North East and it's renewable, we need to get it here. So if there's always talk of pylons, that does create, you know, we've had members debates in here, it does create tensions with communities and there can be resistance to that, even though for the greater good and for the, for the wider good, we do need to have these transportation um, infrastructure put into place. Do you think community benefit would be the way to address some of that or do you think there needs greater leadership from government and government to have more levers to say this is what has to happen? I think we need both. I think, I mean, the history of Shetland in that respect is actually quite illustrative and quite interesting. That the Zetland County Council, which became Shetland Islands Council in the 1970s, uh, was famously relatively tenacious and argumentative towards the oil and gas industry, which needed Shetland. They really needed, given the technological means at the time and where the oil basins were concentrated and towards the north and the north and uh, east of Shetland to have this this terminal at Solon Bow. And you know, to some extent this has been mythologized, but the council did drive a relatively hard bargain. And actually one of the good things that the nineteen seventies Labour government did was put through legislation that gave the council considerable power over ports and planning decisions that meant that they earned money from what were called disturbance payments. And I think disturbance payments is an interesting phrase in the in the early seventies and the mid seventies and then when oil production started, they also earned an annual rent from the terminal as well as from the use of the ports. I think we should be thinking about something similar for for the renewable sector. And, you know, we should think about the levels of benefit and where they're offered. There might be room for greater, much greater benefit community council, but I think also local government level. I mean, local government's been stripped back and suffered hugely in Scotland in recent decades and borne the brunt of austerity in recent years. There's opportunities here, I think, to create decentralised fiscal revenue streams that we should be considering. Mm -hmm. I, mean, yeah. I, I think it's good that the, the government, present government, have taken the decision to install the grid from the north mm -hmm. right down into the north of England. Because I think it's ludicrous at the present time that sometimes they have to turn off wind farms, for instance, because... They can't use the electricity. And it's a learning cycle as well. I mean, people, when I'm an electrician to trade, I serve my time in the coal board as an electrician. And one of the biggest problems is always how do you store electricity, you know? And now they're developing, you know, there's a potential for battery units being done. They're looking, as you know, clear in the, the Oaken Carbon Power Station site. They're, they're putting in massive investment in new infrastructure for switching. And until we get that system right and get the benefits back into the communities, as you and, and Travis had said, without that infrastructure, you won't do that. You'll just be piecemeal, or oh, we don't need it just now, switch it off, or even get subsidised. The companies, I believe, because they're not using their electricity. No, that's ludicrous. And... and We've got to develop, and it'll take time, it'll take a number of years, but we've got to get the system where when these things, the turbines, solar panels, whatever it is, are producing the electricity, it's there to be used for everybody. Because and I think in the longer term, that will bring the bills down. That must be the aim, I think. How long it takes, I don't know. I'm certainly not at that knowledgeable level, but we need to start moving along those ways. And then the community benefits come in and... Things like, I mean, my involvement with the Coalfield Regeneration Trust, I mean, 
there's recently been a project done down in, in Ayrshire and because of the number of wind farms in East Ayrshire are going to be built down the Dumelot and Cumnock area, what's happened there is good because somebody mentioned, I think you mentioned the town hall syndrome, and it happened in the past when they'd opened cast coal mines and all that, they'd mineral trusts and they gave money to the local community and they'd do up the village hall, do things. But the project they've, they've developed down in, in Ayrshire at this stage, it's called Nine CCs, and it's actually the nine community councils have came together and said, right, let's, it's nice for a community to get, oh, we need a town hall roof for things like that. But the, the plan is to get that money in, and it's £25 million over the next five years, or ten years, sorry, is it? And that will develop into creating jobs, doing other things. And it's that type of working together that is going to be a success in this. And that, I think that's a, a brilliant project, for instance, the NCC down in Ayrshire. Now, as well as um, community benefit, because I earlier said that I represent Fife and I grew up in Kelty, um, and we know what happened when the mines closed there and the damage that caused. In the seat is also metal, which had bifab, it's changed, now it's Harland and Wolf, it's... But the, be the bifab story was, you know, we didn't get the turbine that went to Indonesia. They had, they had the contract for that. It wasn't secured in Scotland. We lost the manufacturing. Now, the counter argument could be, you were talking about public money. Uh, the government would have argued that the Indonesia um, contract was, um, that it was more, it was better for the public purse. There's, I know there's ongoing debates about whether that was true or not, or how real, you know, whether that was a true reflection of the cost of it. But at the time, that was, it was better for the public purse. Um, to do that and it would happen quicker and they'd probably be more secure that it was going to happen. So in terms of delivering our climate change targets, that was the best choice to make. But it left it, you know, we didn't get jobs in methyl, which has a yard sitting there, had experienced workers there who could have done that work. So how do we secure more of the manufacturing base um, while still securing good value for money, while still keeping the change, a pace to the change, can we do that and make sure we, we get a, a supply chain that works in Scotland and across the UK, that we have a greater manufacturing base and we get more advantage from these kind of, the needs mm -hmm. change that needs to happen? I think there's two parts to that question. Um, the first part is actually thinking about what value for public money actually looks like in this framing, because we shouldn't just be thinking about the money that's paid for the cost of the turbine. We should be thinking about the tax benefits that will be produced by the additional jobs and economic activity that will be created. We should be thinking about the cost of not spending money in, in methyl and the surrounding area and you know the cost of actually supporting places that have relatively depressed labour markets and, and economic conditions. But also I think there's a long-term cost that if we don't develop um, opportunities and in, in infrastructures and the capacity to manufacture turbines at somewhere like Bifab, we end up in the situation we are now where we're still dependent overwhelmingly on imported production, which has an environmental cost as well, incidentally. Um, it's not it's not a, a good cost. And, you know, if we're thinking about yards in Indonesia um, or in, in Vietnam, James Meek wrote a really good piece for the LRB a couple of years ago about the Campbelltown yard that shut down, and he traced, he traced the yard that was in competition with in Vietnam where the the human rights abuses and working conditions were, were genuinely appalling. And, you know, that that's the alternative at, at the moment in, in terms of, of our context. So I, I think that the long-term cost of not having a plan in place to develop a, a domestic uh, base in, in renewables manufacturing are, are really considerable, including in stoking opposition to, to future renewables developments and diminishing support for, for transition. And... Increasing the doubts of workers at Grangemouth and in the offshore industry about what their future looks like if they do lose employment in carbon intensive production. Um, you know, some of the, interv the interviews that Ryoko and I recorded with, with workers, are, these are skilled workers who have skills that could be used or with, with relatively minimal retraining could be repurposed in renewables. And certainly the younger workers expect and want to be part of a transition, but they say there are there simply isn't the employment opportunities available, and when they do see them on LinkedIn, they're for 
relatively temporary forms of employment, perhaps in maintenance or construction rather than manufacturing. And, you know, there's considerably less than 2,000 workers, apparently, in, according to statistics from 2022, published by the ONS in, in um, renewables manufacturing in Scotland, which is really much, much lower than it has to be. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think Ewan's right in the sense it's how do you measure, how do you measure the economic cost of things? And if you don't take into the consequences, you know, the jobs, the social aspects and that, it's never a fair measurement. I mean, if I go back to the 1980s, when my own particular colliery Cardown supplied uh, coke and coal to Ravenscraig Steelworks for years, and what the coal board done two years before they closed us, because we were uneconomic, was stop, they stopped selling the coal to Ravenscraig, and we immediately lost £3 million a year in revenue because of the difference between coke and coal, which was a high-grade coal to make steel, and selling it as steam coal. So that immediately placed a revenue loss of £3 million. Ton, uh, £3 million. And I just wonder sometimes that the contracts, as, as Ewan's rightly said, it shouldn't be just based on finance. And the bigger aspect of this is we're all agreeable, I think, and talked about, is for our people, our country, I mean, it's shocking that they can, they can take, like they've done with coal for years, like they're now doing with wind turbines, and these boats that take, pull these barges are polluting the air. It's the dirtiest of diesel oil that they, they do. Thousands of miles of this smoke going up into polluting the atmosphere. So when you look at the carbon footprint, that's, that argument should be in there as well, to see how much pollution is done by bringing those things thousands of miles over here when it could be built in this country with skilled workforce that we could develop quite easily as we've done in the past. Yeah. And I think that's a big... The, the biggest thing I think the government have got is the planning. Mm -hmm. And I think they've got to be much, much braver when it comes to giving out these licences or planning that, no, we're putting... This is what we want, and if you don't meet that, then you don't get the contract. Yeah, yeah. And that's, uh, to me, it's never happened for years now anyway. Thank you, thank you. I'm going to take questions uh, from the audience now. <laughs> uh, if you would like to ask a question, put your hand up and you'll be given a roving mic. And if you keep your questions and um, points as brief as possible, that would be helpful. I'll come to this lady first and then the person at the back. Hi, thank you. Um, I think that um, the... So the, the problem is that uh, the... I've just had a mental block. <laughs> At the moment, 30% of households in Scotland uh, are in, energy, um, in fuel poverty, and up to 90% um, in Shetland are in fuel poverty. And I think some of the um, problems that you've talked about are because of uh, the fact that energy generation and pricing is at the moment reserved to the Westminster government. So do you think that de devolving um, the energy policy w to the Scottish government would be beneficial? That's my question. Okay. Thank um, you. Well, I think I'll take the questions one by one. So Tavis, I don't you want to? Um, potentially. Um, I think more control over energy pricing is, is critical at the level that it works. We still are a part of a national grid around the UK. On terms of homes and healthy homes and, and fuel poverty, um, I think communities and homes want reliable heat and they need homes that don't leak it all out. And that's not about electricity pricing, that'll just deepen the crisis. We need to actually be looking at homes and retrofitting. But that is devolved, isn't it? Yeah, which is, which is devolved. Um, and having a much greater strategy on, on retrofitting. Um, so I've spent the last couple of weeks up in north of Scotland in Thurso working, looking at the decommissioning of Dune Ray and, and the, the rise of wind farms there. You have communities in um, Caithness and Sutherland that are next to gigantic wind farms and they've got so much money they can't spend it all. Literally two or three miles down the road, because they're out of the radius, the geographical area of the wind farm, they've got nothing. 
So this 9CC idea is fascinating, and I have heard about it, where we need to actually come together and pull that money, and build out the right infrastructure for homes, whether it's heat networks, and I think rather than you know, community energy again comes to the fore, can we get really good local heat networks? I think every town, village, and community or city has its own sources of heat. Nikki, you're working in the mines. You know, what's under the central belt? Yeah. Hot water. <laughs> Everywhere, under the poorest parts, the most marginalised yeah. communities. So, yeah, electricity reform and energy market reform, absolutely. But I'm a bit wary of more plans, and I, I just want to get cracking on and get on with this because we need to solve those fuel poverty problems now, and we have opportunities to do so. Mm. Yeah. Um, shall I take another question, or do you want to respond to...? Uh, just my point on that is that it's a national network, and I think that's the way it's got to be because... If you start splitting it off, then I think you'll just get into confusion in a sense, you know. I think because the national grid is the national grid from the top of Scotland to the south, if it existed in some places up north, and that's where we've got to get to, and then everybody can benefit. But just a small point, and, and Travis is one, I mean, my son-in-law actually works with a, a company and they install environmental heating systems. They've done one in Tory, actually. They take the, the water for the, the river, I think it's the D, and, and the heat, it's a communal heating system, and they recently done one in South Shields in Newcastle, where it was mine water, because well, there's a, another miner, at least here, but if you were ever underground and they switch the fan went off and, and, and it, you know, the air stops, they were maybe putting on the, the reserve fan, it gets red hot just like that, you know, and I mean just like that, and all that water's there, and that's what the South Shields one does. It pumps the mine water up, and it's actually a, a multi-storey uh, housing complex for the elderly, and that's now heated completely by that, and that's the potential. You see, it, there's lots of things we can do, if, and that's what I hope British Energy start looking at, not just the big massive projects, but as you say, the community projects, because that could happen in Moncton Hall. They've tested the water there. That was the deepest shafts in Britain, 3,000 feet deep. And the potential for the water in that place is it's hot, if you like, because of the depth. The deeper you go, the warmer it gets. And that, that's an expectation, I think, that we should be looking at very, very... And it, it's no rocket science, you know. It's pretty simple. That I know they put ammonia in with things and that, but... It's pretty simple to do according to what you see. And I think that's where we've got you. I guess the, the only thing I wanted to add was to, to Tavis's comment and building on what Nicky said as well, actually, is about the, the potential for action at a local and municipal level, especially when we're thinking about changes that at the moment we're asking households to effectively make on their own when it comes to particularly getting rid of gas boilers, which is going to be a, a huge challenge and is a huge problem of, of fuel poverty. Um, we're not going to be able to change the international gas price. And if we continue to depend on that for heating our homes, I think we're, that is going to be a considerable problem. The only alternative is very large public subsidies to, to the, the gas industry, which we don't think is a very desirable way forward either. But, you know, in the past, we had important municipal successes in combined heat and power systems, for instance. We, we should be thinking about how we develop that. Given so many of us live in tenement blocks, especially, I don't think it's practical or desirable or sensible for us all to transition individually as private consumers. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, the visitor at the back. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ian Cowan. I've got uh, one very short question and a, a bit of a longer one. Um, my first question is, uh, is there anybody here from the Scottish Government I don't think we do have anybody from the... Or even the, a civil servant, because yeah. I just want them to hear my next question. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, Tavis mentioned Tory, and so did Nicky just now as well. Uh, Tory is a, a, a socially deprived part of Aberdeen, just south of the main harbour. Um, the community there has uh, uh, one piece of green space left. It's called St Fittix Park. It's a nice piece of land, open land. Um, uh, the community there has suffered, firstly, from the expansion of the old harbour during the 
the expansion of the oil industry in the 70s, um, when lots of proper decent housing was knocked down to make way for harbourside development. Um, a, a new harbour has been built to the south now in a place called Nig, just round the corner, round the headland, uh, on the other side of St Fittix Park. Uh, that has squeezed the, the community from the other side, uh, and I've had no benefit from that. Um, the Nig sewage treatment works was also built just w practically within the, com the, the community of Torrey, uh, and they've also had a waste incinerator foisted on them in the last five years, uh, about 300 metres away from the, the closest, uh, from the primary school in Torrey. Um, uh, and the, the community has, has suffered all these, uh, what I would call environmental injustices over the last uh, 20, 30 years. And now um, they've, had, they've had no benefits from it, as far as I can tell, apart from possibly a handful of jobs. Now there's an energy transition zone being promoted uh, which will um, obliterate St Fittix Park and this so-called energy transition zone is being promoted by Sir Ian Wood who's, who uh, made his fortune during the, the expansion of the oil industry in the 70s. Um, and so far the, this project has got through planning planning which is under the control of the Scottish ministers uh, ultimately in Scotland because uh, it's devolved. But in the name of the energy transition, um, Tory is effectively being dumped on yet again. Uh, so it's, it's the absolute opposite of a just transition because the community is just being again left behind. Uh, am I my, it's my impression that the Scottish government, this Scottish government, not just the current one, but previous incarnations uh, have been enthralled to these big businessmen like Sir Ian Wood. Uh, is it Sir Jim Ratcliffe now? I don't know, Jim Ratcliffe of Ineos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the Scottish government has got far too close to these individuals and they've gone all starry-eyed about it. And they've, they've kind of you know, let planning decisions go through, like let, let mm -hmm. Donald Trump's golf course go through in Aberdeenshire as well. Uh, despite the, the the local planning committee uh, finding against it, yeah. um, I don't so want I don't want to cut you off. But do you want to let the panel? Well, I, want, I wanted to, to ask the question. The panel... can, um, there's, a, there's actually a challenge to the uh, to the energy transition zone. Uh, a legal challenge has been taking place at this court of session recently, under the Equalities Act, which shows that the Aberdeen local council took no account of uh, the impact on equalities in, for the local mm -hmm. communities. So it's interesting that that relatively new le legislation is being used. But the qu my question is to the panel, does, that, does this, do they have any faith in the Scottish Government to, to be honest about a just transition? Um, now, Tavis, I'll come to you first, as you'll probably be familiar with um, Tory, and it did come, the inquiry that the committee did, we did take some evidence from mm -hmm. communities in Aberdeen, including in Tory. And I suppose it's around, the gentleman described the kind of community tensions or the, and that community obviously doesn't feel they're being, according to the gentleman, being taken along with the changes. It doesn't feel a very inclusive just transition for some of the people there. And yet the development proceeds. Um, and, and that's where the problem is. Um, I've been intimately involved with Tory. Um, I was on the People's Assembly there, um, working with the Tory Retrofit Project, Nesfit. I know it well. Um, and St. Fittix Park is a beautiful space. Um, and so with, with, with broader back to a just transition, these are the examples where people don't feel included or don't feel listened to. Um, and I'm really glad that Tory has been brought up uh, here, um, and there was a special parliamentary session uh, about a year or two ago um, dedicated to it as well. Um, it, it's critical that, uh, and I'm certainly on record and have written extensively about that I am absolutely against the inclusion of St. Fittix Park in the energy transition zone. Um, I am for an energy transition zone for the city, broadly speaking, and using the vacant and brownfield sites that are extensive around Aberdeen 
and not taking a community's park from under their feet when they don't want it. And you'll hear the opposite. And, and it's the power of the marketing that the community, you'll read um, literature that the community is for this. And they've been consulted extensively. And it's absolutely rubbish. They haven't been. They're, they're, they're against it. So we need to make sure that when we talk about a just transition and the Just Transitions Commission is fantastic and there are plans coming out around a just transition, that they actually translate into meaningful power at the local level. Not consultation, but power. Give the communities the power to engage and to help steer these developments. The community has not had any stake. It's been done to them in relation to Tori. The direction, the structure, the planning, the feedback, it's all been done to them. And you'll find there's actually a lot of community support for an energy transition in Aberdeen because we're Aberdonians. We want the city to be successful. We see the huge opportunities in the green economy. But it has to be done in the spirit of genuine partnership, not top down. And that's what it's been. And that's what a lot of the governance of energy in Aberdeen has been like historically, very top down. So we need to reverse that and flip that and empower communities to, to engage, not just in Torrey, but across the board. But I'm really delighted that you actually raised the question because it's emblematic of what a just transition means in Scotland. Mm -hmm. uh, before I ask you and Nikki if they want to respond to that, I'll maybe see if there's other questions just so other people get uh, I'll bring you... Gentlemen, in, and then if you want to address the Tory question as well, you can do so. We'll just get the mic over. Yeah, so this is a question on a, a different okay. topic about uh, community energy schemes. Yeah, um, so I, I yes, uh, although I might not sound it, I come from uh, Argyll, so I'm used to the indigenous of rural life, and I see the money that goes into our village hall from the local um, wind scheme. Mm. Um, but the thing I wanted to speak about and ask about uh, is a community hydro scheme on Mull, um, which I became, in a small way, an investor. Okay? And this pays me a dividend, but in addition, it runs a fund on Mull, and quite a lot of that fund's then spent on local fuel po po poverty. Mm -hmm. And so my question is, what do, do, do the panel know or think about the possibility of having more... <laughs> community energy schemes, mm -hmm. uh, particularly in the rural parts of, of, of Scotland. On, are, there, are there problems with scaling up uh, to, I mean, I know a wind farm is much more expensive than a runner of the river hydro scheme, for, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. So what do you think about community energy schemes? Mm -hmm. So um, the Goldfield Regeneration Trust, which I've been on since, started in 1999, and a number of years ago, we went in quite a lot in that, mostly in England, to be honest, because we didn't have the same money in Scotland to invest in it. And what we done was we put in solar panels, wind turbines and that, and the benefit went to whatever organisation, the local organisation had. They obviously got much cheaper electricity and things, as we spoke about earlier, and the tariff came back to the Coalfield Regeneration Trust when tariffs were there, but as you know, they gradually phased out, and that was spent back into the communities in general anyway. So I'm fully supportive, and I think, as I said earlier, I hope British Energy don't just look for the big massive projects, which are important, of course, but I think there should be some way of funding ideas, like you say, hydro. I mean, I mean I've... Where was it? I seen one in Ayrshire, actually, a small, very small hydro scheme, you know, where they dam the water and they, they create electricity through that for a local church hall. So, if there's lots of brilliant ideas out there, but it needs some help and investment, and as I say, I think that's a role British Energy should be looking at, you know, as well as the big massive projects, these community type projects where the benefit is there to be seen and there to be used in the locality. I think it's a great idea. Yeah. And you, and do you want to be, because the last two questioners, they do kind of speak to each other, because one has described a community that feels like it hasn't been involved, and in the second question, this gentleman did buy into a scheme and gets personal benefit as well as benefit for his community. I'll start with the last one first and then move on to the, the previous question. Um, I think there, are, there is clearly space for community hydro, and the community hydros are interesting because they're effectively taking up opportunities that 
were too small for the North of Scotland Hydroelectricity Board to take up. And that's a, a hugely important history in Scotland of using hydroelectricity to achieve socially important aims in terms of providing higher standards of living and amenities in the Highlands. But, you know, we've got a, a, a another generation of that, effectively, in these smaller schemes. But there, there are community-owned wind farms as well. I think um, I'm involved in supervising a PhD project that Shin Isla Kinnear is leading, and she's uh, from Fintry, which has a community-owned wind trust. And there are other examples of that in Scotland. And I, I think these examples are important, not really so much in terms of the amount of electricity they're going to produce cumulatively. Like electricity is going to be concentrated in primarily, I think, large offshore wind sites. And I think there was a the early days of the green energy movement, the alternative energy movement in the seventies did have sort of quite utopian ideas about the decentralizing realities of green energy. But I think we can realise elements of that through the important localised benefits that these smaller schemes offer. I would also say that I think there's space for what we might call anchor organisations to have a role here. For instance, I know that North Ayrshire Council owns a wind farm and a, a solar farm as well, and that helps power its buildings and it's lowered its energy costs. It's created uh, jobs and opportunity in that area. And I think there's no reason why hospitals and schools and all sorts of organisations couldn't enjoy benefits from community-owned energy. And I guess that then comes to the opposite case in terms of the, the question of Tory, which I think is a really important microcosm of other, other instances and experiences in the oil and gas industry, which I, I perhaps know, know better from, from Grangemouth. And if we, if we look at some of the submissions that uh, Clare's committee received that around the... Um, the inquiry into Grangemouth, there was a submission from the Community Council um, which said that Grangemouth was already experiencing an unjust okay. transition, that actually the community was living with the toxic effects of oil refining and petrochemicals production and receiving increasingly minimal benefits from it. If you look at the scale of employment that, that okay. the complex was providing compared to that which it had provided in, in decades before. And I think that also then brings up questions about transparency and, and accountability. And I, I think it's difficult for a devolved government like the Scottish government when it's faced with a body like Petro Ineos, which owns Grangemouth. Half of it is owned, of the refinery is owned by Ineos, which is a company controlled by one very powerful man, Jim Ratcliffe, the, the guy that owns Manchester United. And, Petrol China, on the other hand, a nationalised company that is answerable to the government of China. Um, but I do think that the, the Just Transition Commission and its report um, on Greensburg made very important recommendations. And one of them is that there should be no public money or no subsidies granted to energy companies without clear accountability, without clear promises, without a clear sense of what the pred quo quo is in terms of the benefits that the parties involved are getting in and out of this. And I think that's important when we think back to the Scotland licences and employment and renewables as well, because when the, the Scotland round, the first round the Scottish Government controlled, I went out to auction a couple of years ago, significant promises were made about the supply chain and levels of employment. And there was even a, a figure put out of so many jobs per billion pounds. I'd be really interested in going back to that and seeing what's actually come out of it because it wasn't written down, it wasn't concretised. And I, mm -hmm. you know, this is public money, this is our money at the end of the day, and there should be, you know, there should be a, a stricter set of agreements and contingencies around that. Companies were required, wind, offshore wind companies and energy companies going for offshore wind were required to submit supply chain plans to be able to enter the bidding for those offshore leases. Yet. Try and go and try and find one. Yeah. Yeah. And there's no accountability. They weren't legally binding. They weren't, they weren't reviewed. So yeah. that, that, that is a you know, crucial element. Yeah. Um, I've got a question at the back, and there's another question here. What I'll do, is anybody else has a question? Because we don't have, oh, right, we've got about five minutes left. So what I'll do, if I ask the three people to ask very brief questions, and I'll, give the, I'll just take you all at once and get the panel to respond. We'll come at the back first. Okay, I'm very interested in uh, the community benefits. I actually lived in Ardross, um, which had the highest 
number of wind turbines and just taking the point that you were making that community was awash with money and couldn't really spend it um, and yet down the road there was fuel poverty and I really want us to get much smaller, get much more into uh, communities generating their own um, electricity and getting the benefits back. And the gentleman was talking about sort of wind uh, turbines on houses. Now, I went to uh, Madeira and all the um, sort of um, lamp posts have a tiny wind turbine that uh, that obviously generates electricity for their lights. Why can't we get something like that on all new builds and even other houses? They're, they're no bigger than a satellite dish and they're obviously going to help um, getting people's benefits down because the problem is that uh, Basically, the costs of electricity um, to poor people up in, you know, the north, and yet that's where the green energy is being produced. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, if I have the microphone up here and over here. Oh, well, I've been before. Hi, thank you. I've heard some very um, knowledgeable, thoughtful and, and, and sensible and brilliant I ideas from the panel and uh, the audience. I grew up in a D-category pit village in the Durham Cove field uh, and remember all those times, Nikki. Um, and we were only kept open because there was a world shortage of coke and coal at the time. And Walt Disney used our pit ponies for one of his films. Um, what I wonder is, because I, I hear the very good ideas, I hear the innovations, I hear also the frustrations um, in the panel and, and in ourselves, and I wonder what do, does the panel think are the key channel, channels of influence that can uh, get these ideas through? Uh, because it seems to me that, that the, there's very good uh, strategies, very good practical examples, and I don't hear or feel that they're joined together or having the bigger influence that we need to have in this country. Thank you. Uh, if I take the guy with glasses first and then the guy with glasses. Hi, yeah. No, I just wanted to echo what was just said, that there's been some really interesting ideas here, um, especially with the um, community owned or, you know, at least a partly invested in um, their own local renewable energies and the benefits that they get from that. But I just wanted to also challenge some of the things that were said. Um, you know, when we look, the Scottish Government has set a 2045 legally binding target on achieving a, a, re a renewable energy mix. And I just really wanted to challenge the fact that you know, I think a lot of you have spoken in favour of this homegrown manufacturing base for wind turbines. And I think, um, you know, when you look at the prevailing economic winds, but more importantly that and more, you know, dramatic than that, if we look at the timelines required here, we're talking 21 years from today, we're supposed to be zero. And I just don't see the realism in that um, at the end of the day, when you compare it to every pound that would go into developing a local manufacturing, um, you know, Goliath, essentially, for the, the UK and Scottish energy market, would necessarily be delayed. You know, a, a delay, you know, a, a, in a way, it, it would be a cost which would be politically expedient and um, it would show another benefit to local people here, but it would slow down the transition. And there's no denying that, I think, when you compare it to buying stuff which is currently cheaper. And as the man from um, Sydney, I'm sorry, I can't read your name from here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> mentioned, uh, Snowy River, if you know. uh, mentioned um, you know, the, the part of the reason why these costs are so low is the outsourcing of manufacturing. And that is one of the few benefits that did come from globalization, even though the, um, you know, we've seen the negative effects in this country quite dramatically. Mm -hmm. So I just want to see if you guys could speak to the yeah. realism of that. that sort yeah, of that's thing. great. Thank you. And I'll take a brief comment here. It was just to, uh, to say that obviously Scottish Government have legislated recently to introduce local place plans which are intended to empower local communities and I just wondered the extent to which those are going to be successful bearing in mind that Scotland has a relatively weak model of community councils. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. So that is quite a range of questions. And what I might ask members to do, because we are a bit pressed for time now, is maybe do your sum up at the same time. Um, if you reflect on, you can choose yourself which area you want to focus on. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought the question from the uh, young guy, uh, there's one that I tried to tease out earlier around why the decision was made when it came to Bifab to offshore that rather than it uh, to be manufactured here. And I think it is a good point around scale and pace. Uh, and the targets we have to meet. But I'll come to Tavis first, but if you take it as the opportunity for, for okay. closing remarks as well, that'd be good. The man from Sydney and the young yeah. fella from, where are you from, mate? I'm uh, German. You're German, the young fella from Germany. It could be a great book. Um, I'll just be brief. Um, there's a lot of summing up great questions. I think the gentleman at the back nailed it in one, actually, as well. Um, but what you said, ma'am, about what's the sum of the what are some of the key avenues here? So from the work that we do, and this is only this is not the only one, there are many avenues here, but I think it's community capacity I see as, as a major constraint. Um, often we see um, in um, communities that are investing in renewable energy or heat or homes um, is that they can afford to do so. Um, they have um, a nice pool of retirees um, who are really knowledgeable um, and, and, and they have no money. Um, and so building the capacity of everyone to engage in that, to navigate, like, I don't know if you've tried, I've just got a new house and I'm trying to look at heat pumps and, 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 and retrofitting. It's, it's a bloody nightmare. Like, it's absolute nightmare to try and figure out what to do and how to fund it. So bringing those people together, building the capacity of communities, investing in skills yeah. in, in communities, um, investing in jobs in communities, moving away from the volunteerism, which is incredibly important across all walks of life, but when it comes to the, the energy transition, I think we need to give young people jobs. We have graduates coming out of university with skills in, in, in the green economy. We have communities who want to build. Let's bring those things together yeah. much more effectively. Thank you, Tavis. Uh, uh, you uh, thank you. Um, I think the key factors in moving forward and making sure this is a just transition rather than an unjust transition and it is increasingly looking to becoming an unjust transition or control and ownership of our, our energy sector and infrastructures, um, democracy and accountability regarding that control and ownership and also agency. Who are the agents we see is driving this change? At the moment I think it's frankly large conglomerates and private owners and investors. And I think it should be governments at a local and national level, organised workers in the trade union movement and localised communities and their organisations. Um, and I think that, that would be my answer to the, the question about, you know, can't someone else do it? Can't someone else make our wind turbines and our solar panels and we can just import them as quickly as possible because that's the most cost efficient thing to do because of the situation we find ourselves in now. But we, we find ourselves in that situation because of the mistakes we've made in the yeah. past, because of the decisions that were, were already made at BIFAB. I don't think this is some sort of either or question of, of whether you know, we can import material or make it ourselves. I think it's about realising the areas where we do have the potential to, to manufacture and transition. And I come back to a point earlier, the, the place that's having by far the world's most important, largest energy transition is perhaps unsurprisingly the place that makes the most renewable energy um, infrastructure, which is China. Brit Britain is the, the world's, I think, second biggest uh, wind energy importer after Turkey. Um, and it imports most of its stuff from Germany and Denmark across the other side of the North Sea. And that, that's not because of geological con conditions or geographical conditions. It's because of political decisions and, and industrial priorities in both countries. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you, Ewan. And Nikki, if I come to you. Yeah, just to say my, my big hope, and I take the point about who do we lobby, but my big hope is British energy becomes a success because I think they're the key player in this. If, if they get it right, and, and you're right, they keep talking about partnerships with private enterprise and that. And I think to start away, they've got to probably do that. But I would like to see it evolve into becoming a nationalised company in its own right, if you like. You know, 
Uh, the other thing about the, the importing that's the cheapest, you're probably right, and that's a, a financial argument, but I think we touched on that earlier. You've got to, how do you how do you count that cost? Where is the social, where's the jobs that could be created, the apprenticeships, the long-term manufacturing base getting built up in Britain again, which we had many years ago. So that would be my view on that, that it shouldn't just be counted in economic value at that particular time. There must be a much bigger picture produced to show how we can create jobs for young people and all the rest of it. And just for a, my friend there who talked about place plans, because that's place plans is, is an important way for the communities to, to get involved and put forward their plan. Now, the Coalfield Regeneration Trust has been involved. I think we've done mm -hmm. six and five, Claire. We've done a bit, uh, we're in the process, we've done two in Midlothian and former mining communities. And one <coughs> of the problems is that you've got all these consultants out there who are want 30,000, £40,000 for doing this. Yes. And the Coalfield Regeneration Trust does it for nothing. You know, and we're trying to find a way to try and get some cost because there's Believe it or not, there was a place, Rue in Helmsburg, phoned the Coalfield Regeneration Trust and asked for assistance with their place plan. Because what we've done is developed a, a simple card-like system that takes the community into it and shows how it goes forward. The one problem or the one fear I've got about it is that the actual place plan now goes to the local authority. And my fear from the beginning is I hope it's not just a talking shop and it sits there. But what the what the Coalfield Regeneration Trust do, as well as a place plan, they do an action plan, and the action plans can be acted on immediately by the communities. They don't need to wait in the council permission, if you like. So and they bring the two together: place plan, action plan. Even if it sits with the council for a few years, the place plan, the action plans can be acted on immediately. So I just want to. Refer to that. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Claire. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, Nikki. <coughs> uh, that does bring us to the end of um, today's discussion. I would really like to thank uh, Tavis and Ewan and uh, Nikki for their contributions uh, this afternoon. I hope you've enjoyed uh, the discussion that we've had. Um, I'd like to thank everybody who asked questions as well for your input and for attending um, today. Uh, can I remind you, if you would like to fill in the survey, which I think if you have, if you booked with Eventbrite, the survey will be available to you. There's also paper copies here in the room if you want to complete that before you leave. Uh, we do have other festival events um, that are taking place until Friday. And I think this afternoon there's something on US elections, Trump or Harris. I think we know the answer to that question. <laughs> uh, so if you might want to uh, go along to that. But, um, yeah. <laughs> but thank you very much uh, for attending uh, this afternoon. Thank you for your time.